Love, our text for meditation this morning will be the gospel lesson we just shared together. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May his love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Beloved, this past week, Kathy and I had an opportunity to sit down and chew the fat. And I must share with you that I am confused, uh, frustrated, and downright disgusted. Do you know in Hobby Lobby they already have Christmas decorations? <laughs> Does June 25th mean anything to anybody in here? Nope. No, they tell me my birthday is a little later than that. Six months from Christmas. Yeah, I know that really means nothing to you all, but that means five months from Advent, four months from planning for it. So I looked at her and I said, breathe deeply and have a lot of fun over the next couple of weeks because then we're going to look up and it's Easter. I, I mean, they already got Christmas, and, and it's not even, well, it is July now. So I, I'm trying to figure out what all of this really means, because I don't really want to be thinking about Christmas right now. There's too many other things going on when I turn on the idiot box. And to be honest with you, it downright frightens me. It downright scares me. But we sing about this thing called peace. And as I'm listening to the text today, it has absolutely nothing to do with peace. And, and, and it seems like there is a contradiction to this person that I'm supposed to be talking to you about, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he opens his mouth by saying, do not believe that I have come to bring peace. Well, doesn't that stand in contradiction to Christmas? I mean, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, right? He shall be, well, let's take a look at that. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, right? These are Christmas texts that we know and love. Uh, Luke chapter 2, right? Verse 14. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, we are talking about, the, I, I, I mean, Linus after all. I mean, Christmas. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to those with whom he is pleased. John chapter 14, verse 27. I'm getting your exercise in. I know the grill is fired up for some of you. I got you. I got you. We'll just exercise spiritually. John chapter 14, verse 27. Th this is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, talking. The first word is peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Well, beloved, true, true. Christ comes to bring peace. But the challenge for us is that the peace that Christ comes to bring stands in contradiction to the life we choose to live. And the things that are on God's mind, the peace that is on Christ's mind, does not naturally reside in our hearts. And when that truth comes, it creates a bit of a problem. Now, I happen to be somebody who is convinced that all of us, myself included, enjoy life based on the lies that we have told ourselves and choose to believe. I know that's hard to digest, but we enjoy life based on the lies that we have told ourselves and want to believe. You're waiting for the example, I know, I know. You ever heard this phrase, dysfunctional family? Now, 
I have told you before, I'm no genius. I, I, I'm not ashamed to tell you that. I preach Christ and him crucified. I don't know if you're bold enough, but I'm willing to admit that my name is Brian and I am a sinner. I am also willing to admit that I live with sinners. And when you put sinners in a box, guess what's going to happen? Yep, yep. Sin. It don't get no more dysfunctional than sin. And so if we're all sinners, where is a functional family and what does that look like? Right? But we choose to believe that there is such thing as a functional family. But we, at the same breath, say that we are sinners. And the truth of the matter is, who I am is a direct result of the dysfunction I was, or the sin that I was. But we choose to tell ourselves different things. And so when that truth comes, and somebody tells you actually to your face that we are in sinners and in need of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, now we got a problem because I don't want to address the fact that I am a sinner. If I got people like me, I got followers, right? I can text somebody. I can post it, and somebody will like me and call me their friend in China, although I've never met them, but we're friends, and I like their puppy. <laughs> but those are the things that we tell ourselves. But when the word of truth comes to cut us at our core to what life is really about, there enters the problem. And we have tension. Well, speaking of family, that is what's at the heart of this, right? Because in verses 35 through 37, he tells us those sinners that you live with, those sinners that you were raised with, there's going to be a problem. Because I like my family. I like the group of sinners. And our dysfunction or function is what drives me. And I wouldn't know how to be pushed or pulled if it weren't for that group of people. By gosh, I... It makes me who I am, right? We do things for our family. We do things for those people that we love. And in verses 35 through 37, we get a very interesting take. He tells us that there will be division between father and son and mother and daughter and in-laws and all kind of craziness. Well, where's the peace? I, I, I'm looking for Jesus in the midst of this. And so really, what could he be telling us this morning about our families? Is there really going to be separation? Is there, excuse me, really going to be tension over some barbecue this weekend? I really just want to eat my potato salad in quiet and, and lick my fingers when the sauce gets on. I, you know, if sugar doesn't, that's her business, right? I don't know. Just as long as she's full, I'm full, we all burp and go to sleep, right? Why does there have to be tension? But that's what the Bible says. You familiar with Exodus chapter 20, verse 3? Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. You see that very group of people that we love. We have a tendency to put before God. You ever heard the parent that will go to the ends of the earth for their child with reckless abandon? No, little Johnny didn't lie. They wrote it down. We don't have to do any guesswork. He signed the piece of paper. No, not my Johnny, right? My spouse would never, right? My mother and father would never, right? And we put them on higher pedestals than we do being obedient to God. And God says, even your mama and your daddy, sister, cousin, whoever, should not come before the love and respect and obedience you have for God. And the challenge for us becomes, that's hard to do because I tell you every night, good night, I love you, I hug you in the morning, I ask you if you want powder or sugar on your friend's toast. What's not godly about that? But are we putting them before God? And God is not having that, and he wants us to be aware 
of where the tension will come and why we don't understand this peace that Christ has come to bring. Allow us to take this particular portion of scripture in context. In Matthew chapter 10, if we have forgotten, Jesus is sending out the disciples to do God's work. He told them to go out and heal the sick and cast out demons. Well, that's rather interesting, isn't it? Especially as we consider families. But I want to back off your family just a minute because I want you all to enjoy each other when you leave here. And I want you to enter the world of Brian. You all know that one of my personal demons is my weight in a, in a good chocolate chip cookie. And so one of the shows that I am fascinated with is The 600 Pound Life. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a, it's a documentary of sorts of people who are morbidly obese and they connect with Dr. Nauzardin down in Houston, Texas, and he puts them on a weight loss program and then they perform gastric bypass surgery to help them lose weight. Uh, it's interesting because it's considered extreme surgery when they are that morbidly obese. Well, what is fascinating is periodically you run into one of these cases where somebody has been severely obese and they are either dating or married to somebody who is like olive oil thin. I, and they are their caregiver, and they love them because they are dependent on taking care of this person. I mean, and they are doing some things like, hmm, hmm, love you that much, but if you can't do that, you know, there's some basic expectations like wipe yourself, go to the bathroom, take a shower. But that's their definition of love, so we think. But it's interesting to me that the moment they lose weight, the relationship dissolves. Because what has happened is as soon as that demon is gone, there's no longer need to be dependent. And what God is trying to show us is that people that we are close to sometimes define us by the demons he's coming to set free. And so when you're loosed of that demon and you no longer are dependent on somebody to wipe you and you can do it for yourself, it shifts the dynamic. And Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm sending you out to cast out demons. And in our families, we, we love people based on the relationship that we've known. I told you earlier, we call it dysfunction. And so when I no longer have that dysfunction, I don't really know how to interact with you anymore. And so life kind of changes. And so this is the tension that arises when the truth comes. When somebody has to tell you, I love you, but according to the gospel, I'm no better than you, but in this particular area, according to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I want to cast out this demon. Well, now we got tension, right? Because who knows us best than our family? Well, I, I knew you were when you were eating 12 pieces of chicken at one time, and now because you, I don't really understand you. And so here we have the tension building in our text, and it becomes troublesome. And so as Jesus moves us along in our understanding in verse 38, did you hear him? He said, whoever will come after me. <sighs> yeah, I know. Take up his cross and follow me. Can I give that to you in Luke chapter 9? Luke chapter 9, verse 23, puts it a little stronger for us, and I want you to read that with me. And he said to all, if anyone would let him... Can we leave that right there? Kind of cross-cultural nowadays, right? To follow Jesus, you have to deny yourself. Anybody interested in doing that, right? I'm getting ready to indulge, deny myself. And take up, and, and I know, let's understand the text. When the Bible was written, very patriarchal, male-dominated society, so I don't want anybody to be thrown off by the word his but we want to kind of circle his, and we'll put your there, okay? Take up your, take up your personal cross. Can I give that to you plainly? Mind your own business. I got enough drama of my own. I don't need you trying to pick up my cross and yours too. Because when we try to pick up somebody else's cross, life gets a lot more messy than it needs to be. 
Don't you have enough trouble picking up your own burdens? Take up your cross daily and follow him. And so he's reminding us that this relationship with him, this reminder to be in the truth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is something that should happen daily. Not just Sunday, not just Monday. Every day of the week, there's going to be some tension with the truth, with the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've told you once, and I've told you twice. I'll tell you a thousand times. Well, let me make sure we're all clear. For me, June 21st is the start of winter. If the days get shorter, I got to make that switch so I have some sun in my winter. December 25th, 21st, we go to summer. But what I'm saying to you is there's so many ways you can say the weather is hot or cold. Nobody cares. The truth of the matter is we need our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ each and every day. And guess what? That's how the text closes in verses 40 through 42. Because if we're honest with ourselves, this journey is not easy. It's very difficult to walk in this world and with Christ at the same time. And we're trying to figure out what all of that means. And I'm taking up my cross and I'm taking up my burdens. And I want to tell people about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But they were there when they had to clean me and wipe me. And so they don't really let me forget those kind of things. But I have this new relationship with Jesus. And I want to tell you about him, but you won't let me forget And that gets difficult because, guess what? Each and every one of us are ministers of the gospel. And Jesus is sending us out to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ and how he has set you free and how he has delivered you from sin, death, and hell. And you have a responsibility to tell somebody the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's exhausting at times. I mean, I know we smile and praise the Lord and put our gold cross on, and that seems good. And when we get home, we're wiped out because I really didn't want to smile. Half the times I was smiling anyway because of all of this pain, right? And he says, anybody who gives a little one, a little one. Now, 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 if we're following, I told you in Matthew chapter 10, he's sending out the disciples. These are grown men. Newsflash. Ain't no adults in the kingdom of God. I know we got excited. We just baptized baby Grayson. But all of us are like baby Grayson in the eyes of God. We are all his children. You can't find one adult in the Bible. We're all God's children. And he says, if anybody gives a little one of these a cup of cold water, Can you taste it? It, I mean, just the ice is in there just right, and it's just starting to perspire, and and you drink it, and you have no choice but to say, that's what the gospel does, and that encourages somebody along their journey, because you don't know that your smile was a cup of cold water to somebody who was about to give up. You don't know that your hello was that cup of cold water that somebody needed to just keep putting one front in front of the other. Just a simple hug, a simple nod. Yeah, even a simple text, just thinking about you is the very thing that changes somebody's life as they are trying to minister in their own way and to their own sphere of influence. And Jesus says, when you do that, you are advancing the kingdom. I want to close with you in Matthew chapter 25 as we think about this cup of cold water. And there our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells us, for I was hungry and you gave me food. You see that cup of cold water? I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did to one of, excuse me, the least of my brothers, you did to me. Peace comes in a cup of cold water, because that cup of cold water is ministering to the kingdom of God. 
bring peace to God's kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.